Welcome! With us, you're not just a listener, you're part of the community. The movement driving real progress. Let's explore how big ideas can turn into real-world positive impacts together. My name is Ronnie Eriksson and this is the Impact Series. Laura Francois, you're a socio-environmental impact strategist and a real inspiration when it comes to bridging the gap between creativity and the environmental movement. You're the founder of the O Exchange, a nonprofit lab developing a case for O in change making. You've launched global environmental campaigns from Egypt to Cambodia and co-founded a global impact entrepreneurship program called the Spaceship where you developed a curriculum for first-time first impact entrepreneurs. You worked at the intersection of sustainable development and creative economies across Asia and collaborated with heavyweights like the World Bank, the World Economic Forum and Greenpeace. You've also helped mentor over 50 startups, co-designing circular economy models in the garment industry, developing employment programs for refugees and designing programs for rural artisans. You're currently editing your first book, Reload Earth, which, is, which explores navigating the complexities of climate crisis. Welcome. Thank you for having me. That's a pretty impressive background uh, with a lot of interesting points to dig into. Uh, I don't even know which is my favorite part here, but like, I can't say anything. I have a like awe for all of this. Um, each of these episodes, they always start with a big what if question just to get us going uh, before we dig deeper into the specific of each of the parts. So I'm going to throw you into the deep end here. Go for it. So what if we led change making through experiences of awe? A lot could happen. That's the beginning of a story. Um, change making, whether it's social change making, whether it's climate change making, right now has an engine of fear and guilt and shame. Um, all the experiences you just mentioned in terms of my, my history, my story, what I've been up to for the better part of the last decade, a lot of that work, though it might sound really nice on paper, has to do with me making companies, organizations, governments feel bad about what they're doing so that they can change. That was the basis of what I was up to as an impact strategist. So I got into the work because I felt called, I felt like there was nothing else I should be doing on this planet. And then I got out of the work because I realized that it was absolutely soul crushing to constantly be reminding people that the world is going to end mm. and that companies are not doing well enough, good enough, changing fast enough. And all of that, all of the guilt and fear that I was using, it was extremely short-lived. Awe, on the other sense, has a very different reaction when we experience awe. And so your what-if question around change-making and awe, what if we led change-making with awe, I think what would happen is that we would feel very differently about how creative and how um, far seeking we want to go with the changes we want to make. Um, and better yet, I think we would feel deeply interconnected to those changes. It would be self-directed, mm. not imposed by another voice, another impact strategist like me, who's coming to knock at your door to tell you that you have to change your ESG policy. And it's uh, what you're saying there is beautiful because one of my two favorite like economies in this world, you have the like knowledge economy. And then you have the creative economy. And of course, the creative economy follows the knowledge economy because you need to first like know and understand and have your own opinions of things. And then you can be creative, which means like uh, seeing something that is not like there for you yet to see. Uh, and for me to like uh, improve my knowledge, but also the listener's knowledge, like you have this word, word, word awe, or however you say, which is like I'm not that familiar word to me, actually. So it's A-W-E. Uh, then we, we talked about wonder here earlier. Could you explain what that actually means, entails? Mm. Why is it important? That's like, uh, for me, a bit like of mystery. Yeah. It's so great that you use the word mystery, and I'll tell you why. Because awe is all about mystery. And you're a creative. Um, creatives, creativity is the byproduct of mystery. When we experience a lot of mystery, 
We don't know the answers. We're searching for answers. We create things to try to answer those questions. Mm. And awe, the definition of awe, um, is being in the presence of something vast that challenges our understanding of the world. And when I say vast, it can be visually vast. We can talk about being on the top of a mountain, seeing the sunset, but it can also be internally vast, um, like seeing your baby being born for the first time. That's not visually vast, but internally something shifts quite dramatically. So being in the presence of something vast that challenges your understanding of the world in a moment Awe can all of a sudden make you stop in your steps. It's often feeling like it's a feeling of goosebumps or maybe some tears in your eyes, holding your breath, or the the sound, awe, awe, which is ironic, but I love the fact that it's connected in that way. Um, wonder is something that happens after sometimes. So awe is a physical experience. It happens very quickly. It's this, you don't stay in awe for very long. You kind of pass through it. It's a liminal space. And then you end up in wonder. And wonder is about curiosity. It's about, wow, what was that? How did that happen? Where am I going to go f- next? Um, something has changed. How am I going to How am I going to deal with that? Awe right now is being used in a very positive sense. A lot of people use the word awesome. That's so awesome. That's overused. We hear that all the time. But awful, that's awful, is the same. Awe is both positive and negative at the same time. Mm. It's different than joy. It's different than beauty. It's the feeling of truly experiencing a mystery and renegotiating how you fit into the world, mm. which is amazing because that, that fitting into the world and renegotiation is something that I was struggling with for all of my work when it had to do with social environmental movements because I wanted people to have a shift and to renegotiate how they fit in. And when you experience awe, and there's eight different ways you experience awe, by the way, we can get into those. If you experience awe, all of a sudden you renegotiate. And that's a perfect moment to start talking about how you can self-direct that change. Yeah. That's an awesome explanation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I mean, I would think like this beauty of this whole podcast has been uh, how you explain it so well. It's like having this moment of awe with people like you. There is like, mm-hmm. there's been a bunch of you already uh, with like so different, unique, beautiful backgrounds. And I'm just sitting here in awe all the time because I... Ah, the, That's amazing. It's the goosebumps and it's, it's, uh, it's beautiful. And you explain it really, really well. Uh, You, you, before we dive into like the uh, elements of it, like how did you end up here? Like, I, like of course, like we read your background and seen the uh, like multitude of things that you've done, but like, why are you in this segment? Hmm. Um, I didn't just wake up one morning and say I want to explore awe, um, <laughs> though that would have also been a great story. Um, I had done, over the course of my work, I had often collaborated with artists. Mm. I consider myself creative with a small C. Other people, it's a capital C. There are creatives in this world that absolutely blow my mind. And I remember the first time I collaborated with um, my co-founder, my now co-founder, but artist Ben Von Wong. He's an installation artist. He uses um, waste to create installations. We had collaborated together in Cambodia. I was working in an abandoned garment factory from a textile factory, probably brands that you and I, probably someone in this room is wearing a brand that was created in one of these factories. Um, And the amount of textile waste that's in these factories is insurmountable. Hundreds and thousands of bags of clothing that's just going to be burnt and completely just off, off the face of the planet. Um, how do I convey the amount of clothing to you? I can show you a statistic. I can send you a report. I was doing all those things and nothing was changing. I collaborated with Ben to create installations using the fabric that was in that factory. And the installations were representations of the quantity and also the amount of energy and resources that are, that, that that it takes for us to create this clothing. 
And that created more impact than anything I had said before, any reports I had created, any stats. I was, I had done a TED talk about this. It was like, how do I get this through? And nothing worked until I collaborated with artists. And I had done that again in Egypt. I did that in Singapore. We, we did this again and again, where I took something really dry and we tried to Trojan horse it. We tried to um, translate it into something that made people feel something. And so after the pandemic, so about a couple of years ago, I started thinking, I felt very, very um, jaded. I felt very eco-anxious. I was no longer connected to my work because I felt like the impact I was having was just, it was just not happening. It was not, it was, it was too small. It was too insignificant. And I thought back to what it was that I felt created the most amount of impact. And it was never anything I could measure. It was always something I could feel with the people in the room, with the stakeholders I was working with. And it always connected to the moment that people had this feeling of awe, where they were then willing to talk to me in a very different way. And so it wasn't the art. It could have been anything. It was art, and this art is a huge, incredible driver of awe. But there are many other ways that we can experience awe. And so when I thought about how I want to continue growing myself, growing my work, I did not want to st continue staying an impact strategist that uses the tools that I was taught, the strategies that I had implemented. They weren't adequate anymore. And so I, I looked into the research around awe, and there's an amazing body of research coming out of UC Berkeley. Um, Dacher Keltner is an incredible human being who's been diving into the research behind awe. And I want to take that research and create shovel-ready tools, tools that we can implement on the ground with the communities that I do work with, the climate justice communities, um, the socio-environmental spaces that I'm a part of. So how do I bridge the knowledge from these universities that's talking about behavioral science, how we experience awe, and how do I connect it to the work that I used to do in a way that makes me feel really hopeful mm -hmm. about the fact that I'm no longer using fear as the main way to get across to people? That's how I came into it. It was essentially a burnout from my past life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really, really beautifully explained. Uh, things like this is kind of like a bit same uh, topics that Catapult Future Fest is actually working with, like the whole set. Have you been here before? I have not. This is my first time. First I'm time. a newbie. Super nice to have you here. I, I think this is what the whole event here is about. Mm. It's about like uh, bringing such a diverse and impactful group of people together that each conversation you have uh, leaves you with wonder or awe. Uh, like that's uh, how I experienced it last year. Because people are working from so different kind of perspectives on things and actually like coming with so much, much optimism. Here it's not about everyone just like running around and sharing the problems and, and it's like the, not the normal technological startup pitch either that you kind of like try to explain a problem and then how you solve it and then uh, uh, running around like getting cash. It's more about creating those genuine connections. With New Nordic Way again, uh, which is the organization uh, I and we represent, uh, we are actually working with a bit similar kind of like model that you have gone through as a journey for yourself, which is based on the realization that most of our investments and money is actually put in like technology and these highly scalable things. The problem is that nor it doesn't translate to normal people anymore. And who can do that translation in a really effective way are the artists, the creatives, the creatives with the big C because those, they create experiences and things that makes people's hearts sing. Uh, something that Steve Jobs also uh, said really well back in the days that we need the humanities and arts because technology alone can't make people people's hearts sing. Uh, and I think that's where you also are doing a really good thing. If you go and throw things to the news and tell how bad things are, people are like, okay, yet another bad thing. If you make them really feel that awe or, or like wonder or any of like these like uh, internal feelings, you can actually like make people feel uh, a part of that thing. So I really get where you come from. Mm. So you've gotten deeper into that subject. Uh, you've started to like also understand how to create those situations, something I, I wish to learn from you here. Uh, then maybe I'll get to know the tip of the iceberg, but something I hope we can delve deeper into also afterwards. But how does it work? 
Hmm. That's a mystery. I don't know. <laughs> and nobody does. Um, awe is all about mystery and awe is not prescriptive. I can't say, Ronnie, feel some awe for me right now. Go for it. I do it already. <laughs> so you're doing it already. So maybe not in this case. But it's not something I can... Um, no, nobody can prescribe awe. But there are these eight, I'd say situations that are quite universal. Almost 80% of the world will experience awe in those ways. And what the way it works in my mind, or as in what we do at Awe Exchange, is we explore those eight ways and figure out, thinking of them as ingredients, baking a cake. So you have these eight ingredients, and we want to use them to explore how the strategies we used to use in the impact space, think of any strategy, think of the circular economy, mm -hmm. think of donut economics. Um, the donut is dry. <laughs> it's a dry donut. Um, any, like any systems, uh, any systems um, designer or any impact entrepreneur that uses something like a theory of change, these are all technical frameworks that are really important to have, but the emotions, the emotions are very, they're void of emotions. So how do we use these eight to weave into the work that's really important to have in a way that organizations that are creating change will leverage those, those frameworks very differently? Um, so that's the way it works. The way it works inside is when you experience a moment of awe, when I talked earlier about renegotiating your place in the world, what often happens is that you feel part of a system. So if you and I take a deep breath right now, let's just... So there's oxygen going into your lungs, my lungs. We're in an interconnected relationship with a tree somewhere mm -hmm. in that breath. That's awesome. How do I slow down enough to feel that interconnection with a tree. Well, I need mindfulness. I need to slow down enough to even witness or, or even experience that. Um, you could be in front of a sunset, but if you're on your phone, you're not going to necessarily experience any awe. So presence is really important. And curiosity is really important too. How do I know that I'm having a relationship with a tree by breathing? Well, it's because I looked into how trees work and, you know, like there was this education component to it, exactly. right? Um, so that's how that that's part of how it works. Um, I'm not a behavioral scientist. Um, I think they're incredible people doing really important work right now. Um, but I lean on the 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 brains of behavioral scientists because what they're looking at is how you can connect a moment of awe to a behavior change. And one of the equations I like using is by sociologist B.J. Fogg. He talks about behavior change being three things. A prompt, like a sudden prompt, motivation, and ability. So a prompt is something that will like slap you in your face, like something that happens, and quickly followed up by a feeling of, I can do something, and I have the tools to do it. What if the prompt was awe? What if the prompt was one of those eight being nature or music or moments of birth or moral beauty, which is being in awe of somebody else, being in awe of what someone has done for somebody else? What if those were the prompts and we followed it up with motivation and ability? What could happen? What kind of behavior change could happen versus the prompt being guilt? What's the difference? So those are that's kind of in the how of how we're baking this cake is using very different ingredients. So what are the eight, eight like? So moral beauty is probably my favorite and the most widespread. It's the one you feel the most often, likely, um, which is when you meet somebody. Uh, the example, I mean, I'm feeling this a lot with what's happening in Gaza at the moment. You experience a lot of awe. Um, again, awe is not joy. It's the feeling of truly almost a reverential feeling when you when you witness somebody doing something for somebody else, for the for the goodness of somebody else. Nature is a huge one. Mm. Shooting star. I saw my first shooting star not that long ago. I can't believe it took me that long. Um, but that's also a statement for how we, we live. If we live in cities, we're very far from the awe of nature oftentimes. 
it's it, it's it's more challenging. You can feel awe in nature seeing something grow through a cracks in a pavement, yeah. but it's harder to do. Um, astronauts often felt a lot of awe when they saw the Earth. It's called the overview effect, right? This feeling of wow, I want to protect this thing because I've been out and saw it from a different from a different angle. A lot of astronauts came down and had a very different relationship with nature. So how do we experience the overview effect? We off, we're not going to go to, I hope none of us are going to space. It's way too expensive and way too polluting. But how do we experience the same overview effect by being on Earth? Nature is a big one. Music. There are songs that will make you feel something. It might not be your favorite song, but something will shift in you and you won't be able to describe it. Music is a huge one. Collective effervescence. When you're at a concert or a football match and you're all cheering for the same team and you don't know the person next to you, but you want to hug them and high five them, that feeling, your heart rates are actually synchronizing. It's proven that in collective effervescence, you're, you're all synchronized. That's also a feeling of awe. And then other ones have to do with moments of death witnessing somebody dying. Um, my first job was an end of life care in palliative care. Um, and I remember the nurses talking about the moments of death um, and how it's not actually as sad as we make them out to be. They're quite filled with mystery. They're quite filled with reverence. So moments of death, moments of birth and art. Um, I felt awe the first time I watched Star Wars. It doesn't have to be art in a museum somewhere, it can be anything, but creativity is a huge one. Um, and of course, we, we, we can't leave out spirituality. Um, awe is very connected to religion. It doesn't have to be religion. It could just be the belief in something bigger. Um, so spiritual moments, epiphanies, things like that. It's really fun uh, how you're when you're stating each of these different segments i, I kind of like started to think of like that certain moment and mm -hmm. then you know like always chills goes through my body like uh, finding that kind of moment uh, in my life and i could like find one directly which one did you have the most chills for um uh, probably they're like the collective collective one. effervescence yeah, yeah, yeah. because yeah. Uh, those have been like pretty moving moments when there be like i come from little finland you know like we don't have that much people then when you have gone somewhere uh, abroad actually mm. joined an event with 30,000 people 50,000 people 100,000 people at the same time somewhere enjoying one certain thing that's pretty mind-blowing of course nature like finland i remember always remember my first northern lights for example when you just like you always have known that they are up there i've seen them a couple of times because you probably first time see them it's the whole uh, light is full of them like that just automatically happens and in each segment like music i am a huge like fan of music mm -hmm. uh there is like those classic songs that I listened to the radio when I was a kid that I still hear today and they automatically create that moment for me because it's not the song actually it's like maybe being like in my mother's lap and all of these like things so it's fun it's pretty impressive like just by going through those like it creates small moments of all, all the time so I can see that it's actually a good exercise for those who listen like try <laughs> to think about them because that's true it happens uh pretty easily that's true and it's wild that those are those are not my eight those came out of the center for greater good at uc berkeley they're they're research backed and one of the most beautiful um studies that was done in relation to nature to give you an example of of how they're research backed um there there were basically researchers went to a car park a parking lot and asked people to draw themselves on a piece of paper and their drawing took up almost the whole paper mm. and they did the same exercise when people saw some of the biggest trees in the world in yosemite valley they were coming out of the park the national park in the u.s and they asked them to draw themselves and most people drew a tiny little stick figure at the bottom of the page not the whole page and it talks about the fact that when we experience these whether it's in nature or not any of those eight we feel smaller not not small in terms of insignificant or powerless, smaller in the sense that we feel part of something so much bigger than us. It puts everything into perspective and it actually makes us feel this interconnected feeling that's the fabric of how we create change. Create change is never a singular siloed thing. It's not you or me creating change. It's how do we create change within a system? But how do I feel part of a system? 
that's really hard to do. It's really hard for me to wake up and say, okay, how does my work connect to the system? What is the system? But when we feel these moments of awe, it's almost like it comes clearer a little bit in a way mm. that we can't necessarily describe, but it's there. Exactly. And it's crazy how you normally like these uh, feelings of awe. Uh, you, you feel those most in the things that are not that fabricated or only came up through the imagination of like the human mind, but actually things that relate to things that are really real. So like, as you said, like nature and music and things that are like there, uh, like certain societal constructs don't give you that same thing. Uh, uh, religion, of course, gives it, but then it's always like the higher thing of the religion, not like the maybe church, for example, itself, but actually like the larger context of it, like what is the mystical thing there, mysterious thing. Yeah. Uh, really interesting topic you're working with. So uh, what's next in that segment? What are you like aiming to actually do? Uh, what is the impact of that work? Mm. Uh, who are you helping? Mm. Those are all really good questions. Um, we are currently in a place where we are developing case studies. Um, I am, I realize that everything that we talked about if those listening are part are are similar to my community of impact strategists or social entrepreneurs um all of this sounds very much floaty it sounds very much up here it's it's um it's not very tangible it's wonderful to talk about awe it's wonderful to talk about these moments but again how does it relate to the fact that we have a poly crisis on our hands and in a very real way the clock is ticking So how do we reckon with both of those things? And so Awe Exchange is developing a series, of, a series of case studies where we're implementing Awe with Awe generators. We're not Awe generators, but we work with Awe generators, whether those are creative people, whether those are, um, I mean, there's so, there's it's not necessarily creatives. I just want to say Awe can obviously happen in so many different ways. Um, you can meet a farmer and he can explain to you or she can explain to you how bees are so integral to their farming practice and you can feel awe. awe. I mean, I know so many farmers who are awe generators, in my opinion. Um, so we collaborate with awe generators and we explore ways that we can weave in what it is that they do, or the way that they think, the way they explore the world into these strategies. So I'll give you an example. Um, we're working on a project with Parks Canada. Um, they're one of Canada's biggest national, um, um, I'd say, environmental resiliency arms. Um, and we are building a microforest in the middle of the city of Montreal, um, 50 trees, not that much. We are raising funds for these trees. We're raising funds for people to become tree guardians. We're also working with a Um, an artist who is going to be um, composing music with those trees, biofield musician. So somebody who connects probes to a living thing like a tree and can create music. When someone who is becoming a tree guardian, someone who is in, uh, donating for a tree to be planted, if they experience a musical moment with a tree, are they more or less likely to donate for the next 10 years, 100 years? They have an intimate relationship with a tree now. Does that change something? And those are the types of case studies we're gathering, and we're 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 essentially trying to understand what works, what doesn't work. Um, so that's what's next is the gathering of those. This is a huge hypothesis. I have I'm sitting here um, pretending like I know exactly what's going to come out of these. I don't, um, but I have a really strong feeling that there's something magical at the end of this. Um, and what that will look like, no idea. There's a lot of mystery in awe. There's a lot of mystery in my life right now. I've had to give up the idea of measuring awe. Um, but what we are going to look at are indicators and indicators of behavior change and in indicators of action. What does awe to action look like? Um, how is awe used as an antidote to apathy or eco-anxiety? So that's ne what's next. It's the development of that practice. Um, so looking for imagination-focused um, um, partners in that is something we're looking for, uh, looking for collaboration opportunities with, with organizations that have impact at their core but who are open to a new way of doing that. Um, so that's what's next. There's a lot. <laughs> 
No, it, it's wonderful. And if you think about like with the big economies that are actually like on the rise, it's the rise of the experience economies that are hands. Huge. This is exactly what you're doing. If you can actually bridge the gap between like impact companies and the experience economy, helping people actually experience what they have to offer, uh, there is tons of, of like capital there uh, that will move both sides like both you and then the companies forward so I clearly can see where you're headed mm. uh, and it makes a lot of sense music festivals is like just one of our great examples they can also have a great impact on people how they experience uh, life overall yeah. uh, for their like social uh, inclusion and, and social possibilities also of people so yeah I mean it's important also to mention that the that awe is not just for those that can afford to go to a music festival. Yeah. Awe is not just for those who can afford to travel and see the Northern Lights if you don't live close by. How do we also bring awe or or remind, it's not bringing awe, we're not bringing anything. We're, we're essentially reminding people of this universal human experience mm-hmm. in spaces where there is a lack of awe or a lack of a reminder of awe. Um, so this is also important for us to hold both, right? Um, yeah. So I'll I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. How how that's a bigger question for me and for all of us is that how do we bring it forth in the work where it's truly grassroots and it's truly focused on um, creating change at the bottom of the pyramid? What does all look like in that space? Yeah, and I think that's actually a really good tangent to kind of like uh, uh, end our beautiful episode. It's always good to end with a, a open question. So uh, we let people answer that and, and we can let you continue your amazing or awesome work. Thank you so much. This has been a really, really grounded and good discussion. Uh, I can't wait to like continue this with you, hopefully like in the near weeks or near future. Mm. I wish you the best possible Catapult Future Fest. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Ronnie. Really appreciate this conversation. Thank you.